and welcome to this BakerBots webinar on EU and US sanctions on Iran and Russia. My name is Chris Caulfield and I head the BakerBots sanctions practice in London. I'm joined today by Arma Adams, a partner in our Washington office, and Kieran Uni, an associate in our London office. Before we start, I would like to say a little bit about our sanctions practice at BakerBots. BakerBots acts as lead counsel to a host of global entities in relation to sanctions issues. For example, in relation to the recent Russian sanctions, we've acted as lead counsel to one of Russia's largest energy companies, one of its largest banks, and one of its largest airlines, along with acting for a host of EU and US oil field services companies and other businesses. The global nature of today's business world means that frequently both EU and US sanctions regimes are engaged by a particular transaction, and we work closely on both sides of the Atlantic to deliver a seamless service to our clients. The nature of work that we do ranges from advising in relation to specific transactions, carrying out investigations and audits, representing clients before national authorities, implementing compliance programs, and performing due diligence on corporate acquisitions. The format for today is that Kieran will now address the position in respect of the EU and Iran. I will then look at the EU sanctions regime on Russia before Arma addresses both Russia and Iran from a US perspective. I'll hand over to Kieran Uni. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to speak about the EU sanctions regime against Iran. <clears throat> I'm going to talk briefly a bit about the background to the regime, then the period of thawing, third, the joint comprehensive plan of action that was implemented earlier this year, and finally, I'm going to talk a bit about the future. So, background. The EU first imposed sanctions against Iran in 2007 to meet the objectives of UN Security Council Resolution 1737 in 2006, which introduced restrictive measures against Iran. Why were sanctions first imposed? Well, the principal reason was uh, fears of nuclear proliferation. There were serious concerns over the Iranian nuclear program. Also, Iran's continued refusal to comply with its international obligations and cooperate fully with the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA. Now, just a few words about the IAEA. It was set up in 1957 in response to the fears resulting from the discovery of nuclear energy, and it was set up as the world's center for cooperation in the nuclear field. There are currently 165 members, of which Iran is one, and the IAEA uh, continues to act as a nuclear watchdog and a rigorous advocate for safety and security and to promote the safe, secure and peaceful use of nuclear technologies. A final reason why sanctions were imposed were in relation to the human rights violations which um, Iran had been uh, alleged to have perpetrated. Who was targeted by the EU sanctions? Well, first and foremost, the persons and entities involved in nuclear and ballistic missile activities or the development of nuclear weapon delivery systems, persons complicit in or responsible for directing or implementing grave human rights violations, for example, the repression of peaceful demonstrators and journalists, torture and indiscriminate or excessive application of the death penalty, including public executions, stoning, hangings, or the execution of juvenile offenders, all in contravention of Iran's international human rights obligations under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, and um, two covenants on human rights which Iran had ratified, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, ratified in 1976, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ratified by Iran also in 1976. So what were the sanctions that were imposed by the EU? Well first, 
there was a prohibition on the export or import of items to or from Iran which could be used for the development of nuclear weapons um, or technology. And that included materials that could contribute to enrichment-related reprocessing or heavy water-related activities or the development of nuclear weapon delivery systems. And these items could include all kinds of military arms uh, and related materials such as weapons, ammunition, military vehicles and equipment. There was a prohibition also on technical assistance and financing related to such items. Also, inspections of cargo to and from Iran of aircraft and vessels um, at EU airports and seaports that were owned by um, the Iran Air Cargo or Islamic Republic of Iran shipping line. There were restrictions imposed on lending to the government of Iran. Enhanced scrutiny over activities with Iranian financial institutions. And an asset freeze was imposed and travel restrictions imposed for listed Iranian persons and entities. Uh, Chris will talk more about the asset freeze in due course in relation to Russia sanctions. But very briefly, the asset freeze um, consisted of a prohibition on making available any funds and economic resources to listed individuals and an obligation on EU persons to freeze all funds and economic resources owned or controlled by listed individuals. The next question is, who is bound by EU sanctions? And the answer is, anyone or any company in the territory of the EU, any person on board an aircraft or vessel under the jurisdiction of an EU member state, any EU national, no matter where in the world they are, any company or other entity incorporated under the law of an EU member state, and finally, any person or entity in respect of any business done in whole or in part within the EU. In 2010, there was a considerable ramping up of sanctions against Iran. And this followed UN Security Council Resolution 1929 in 2010, which widened the scope and introduced additional restrictive measures. The sectors that were targeted were the oil and natural gas sector, petrochemicals, the arms and military sector, and also in relation to dual-use goods, gold, diamonds, and precious metals, aluminium, steel, graphite and other raw or semi-finished metals, shipbuilding and shipping, and the finance and banking sector and also insurance. In addition, further persons and entities were made subject to the asset freeze and travel restrictions. So we come to about two years ago and the period of thawing started to take place. In about November 2013, negotiations started in Geneva between the P5 plus one countries, that's the permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany, the EU, which was represented by the High Representative of the EU for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, at the time Catherine Ashton, that's now Federica Mogherini, and Iran. And finally, after weeks of discussions and negotiations, an interim agreement called the Joint Plan of Action on the Iranian nuclear program was signed on the 24th of November 2013. The JPA provided that from the 20th of January 2014, Iran was to freeze short-term key parts of its nuclear program and this included limitations to be imposed on Iran on all uranium enrichment related activities. Also, Iran was to phase out certain centrifuges, decline to manufacture or assemble other centrifuges, convert certain nuclear facilities into nuclear physics and technology centers, redesign and rebuild heavy water research reactors to support peaceful nuclear research and radioisotope production, the medical and industrial purposes only, 
and not to produce weapons grade plutonium. In exchange, Iran was to enjoy limited, targeted and reversible sanctions relief for six months pending the conclusion of a long-term agreement. The EU, in turn, was to refrain from imposing any new nuclear-related EU sanctions, suspend prohibition on import, purchase or transportation of Iranian petrochemical products and any related financing. It was to suspend the prohibition on the provision of insurance and transportation in relation to Iranian crude oil, to suspend the prohibition on the trade with the government of Iran in gold and precious metals, and to permit more financial transfers to and from Iran for non-sanctioned trade to be processed without a license. After about 17 months of further negotiation, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was finally concluded uh, earlier this year. The final negotiations for a framework deal first began in Lausanne on the 26th of March of this year between the P5 plus 1 plus EU plus Iran. And on the 2nd of April, agreement was reached on the key parameters for that framework deal. On the 14th of July, the JCPOA was formally agreed in Vienna. And this was a historic nuclear non-proliferation agreement with Iran. It was extremely detailed. It stands at about well, over 100 pages. And it contains a long-term plan to limit Iran's uranium enrichment and nuclear-related activities. Iran is to proceed with an exclusively peaceful indigenous nuclear program and in exchange a long-term plan is to be implemented to suspend and ultimately terminate nuclear related EU, US and UN sanctions. <coughs> On the 20th of July UN, the UN Security Council unanimously adopted resolution 2231 which endorsed the JCPOA and established a monitoring system for Iran's nuclear program. On the same day, the EU Foreign Affairs Council endorsed the JCPOA. On the 23rd of, 23rd of August, just a month later, the British Embassy in Tehran reopened and the Iranian Embassy in London reopened. And then finally on the 18th of October, or roughly the 18th of October in a few days' time, uh, there is to be the formal JCPOA Adoption Day. So what are the key features of the JCPOA? Well, there are a few immediate sanctions changes. There is to be limited sanctions relief under the original interim JPOA, which will be rolled over to 14th of January 2016. The IAEA is to be present in Iran long term to monitor its nuclear and enrichment related activities. But the only far-reaching changes under the JCPOA, of which there are many, will occur only from Implementation Day, which is uh, projected to be early 2016. Now, no date is set currently for Implementation Day, but it's said at the moment that implementation by Iran of the nuclear-related measures that are set out in the JCPOA is likely to take about six months. So whenever the IAEA finally certifies that Iran has met its initial nuclear rate of commitments, implementation day will occur. And from that day, whenever it is in early 2016, the EU is to terminate vast, well, the vast majority of restrictions related to Iran's nuclear program. And that's those restrictions relating to the oil and gas sector, petrochemical sector, any restrictions involving overall investment in Iran, the financial and banking sector, insurance services, shipping and shipbuilding, access of Iranian cargo flights to EU airports will be allowed, <coughs> 
trade in gold and precious metals and diamonds will be allowed, and trade in Iranian banknotes and coinage will be permitted. The EU will also lift its asset freeze against several designated individuals and entities, for example, Bank Meli, Central Bank of Iran, the National Iranian Oil Company. The EU will refrain from reintroducing sanctions terminated under the JCPOA. And finally, the EU will refrain from any policy intended adversely to affect the normalization of economic relations with Iran. And that includes um, a restriction against introducing any policy or measure having equivalent effect to formal sanctions. What does the future hold? Well, until 2023, certain restrictions will remain. There will still be restrictions in arms and military sector. There will be a general embargo. There will be restrictions on nuclear ballistic transfers and related services. Restrictions on financial messaging services, including SWIFT. Certain restrictions in the transport sector, for example, inspection of cargo, bunkering services, engineering and maintenance services to Iranian cargo aircraft. There will remain certain restrictions on trade in graphite and other metals. Certain restrictions will remain on trade in software for integrating industrial processes. And there will be a continued asset freeze for certain persons and entities. Now, the 2023 date isn't fixed. It could be earlier if the IAEA concludes that all nuclear material in Iran remains in peaceful activities. The P5 plus 1 plus EU and Iran will meet at ministerial level every two years to review and assess the progress. In 2023, there will be hopefully transition day when the EU will terminate or suspend all remaining sanctions restrictions and then two years later there will be UNSCR termination day which is when the the 2015 Security Council resolution that's 2231 which endorsed the JCPOA will formally terminate and the, U, the EU will formally terminate all of its sanctions legislation against Iran. Now, the termination of EU sanctions against Iran is by no means a certainty. The sanctions may snap back where Iran fails significantly to perform its commitments under the JCPOA. And there's a dispute resolution mechanism or a complaint mechanism under the JCPOA where any complainant can refer its complaint or dispute to a joint commission which consists of representatives from each of the P5 plus one countries plus EU plus Iran. If the complaint or dispute can't be resolved adequately at that level, there'll be a referral to an advisory board that consists of three members, one nominated by Iran, one by the P5 plus one plus EU, and a third independent member. If Resolution can't be made at that level, there'll be further referral back to the Joint Commission and ultimately there will be referral to the UN Security Council. And what's interesting is the UNSC um, has to adopt a resolution to continue to lift the sanctions and for that resolution unanimity will be required. And that means that each of the five permanent members of the UNSC possesses the power to veto the adoption of the continued sanctions relief and conversely no one single member has the power to prevent the reimposition of the old sanctions regime. The UK government has publicly offered to assist UK companies wishing to explore the Iranian market upon the lifting of sanctions. The UK government has said that it will help the business and financial sector to take advantage of the opportunities that arise and to promote trade and investment between the UK and Iran. And Her Majesty's government has pledged to work to support those businesses that wish to take advantage of trade opportunities. 
and a functioning embassy in, in Tehran has been said to be a key part of Her Majesty's government's role in supporting British business. However, we think Iran will remain a challenging market for EU companies for some time ahead. EU companies will need to take into account the potential application of US sanctions that remain in place during this period. EU banks and other EU financial institutions may remain reluctant to handle Iran-related transactions while US sanctions remain in place. And the delay in the provision of specialised financial messaging services like SWIFT could prove burdensome for future business operations with Iran in practice. The JCPOA has been described by the EU as a balanced deal that respects the interests of all sides, although it has its critics. It's going to be a slow, arduous process ahead that could take up to a decade before sanctions are completely terminated. But from early next year, there could be a wealth of commercial opportunities for EU businesses in Iran. I'm going to hand over to Chris Caulfield now to talk about the EU sanctions regime against Russia. Thank you, Kieran. So, in terms of EU sanctions against Russia, we're going to firstly look at the application of those EU sanctions, and then three main areas for concern – asset freezes, energy sector restrictions, and lending restrictions. Uh, there are some other more peripheral restrictions that we'll look at briefly, uh, primarily related to the military sector, and then we'll look at the EU's approach to enforcement and also what the future might hold. In terms of the parties to whom sanctions apply, quite widely drawn. So persons or entities in the territory of the EU, persons on board aircraft or vessels under the jurisdiction of the EU member state, EU nationals, companies or other entities or bodies incorporated or constituted in the law of an EU member state, and persons or entities in respect of any business done in whole or in part within the EU. So an EU national who is operating from a Singaporean company and is based in Singapore, for example, would still be bound by his EU nationality obligations. So, first, asset freeze and travel ban. The EU lists individuals and entities that are subject, in the case of individuals, to an asset freeze and travel ban, in the case of entities, just to the asset freeze. The asset freeze has got two aspects to it. The first is the freezing of funds and economic resources owned or controlled by listed individuals and entities. Accordingly, if you're an EU bank and you hold money for a listed person, then you have to freeze those funds. The other side of the asset freeze is a prohibition on making funds and economic resources available directly or indirectly to or for the benefit of listed individuals and entities. So effectively, sanctioned persons are hived off from dealings with those who are bound by the EU sanctions. Now that creates complexities in a number of areas, uh, and frequently in the area of satisfaction of claims because it prevents payments being made to or received from sanctioned entities or persons. There are a limited number of derogations and exemptions uh, which authorise such payments and require a license application before they can be made. In terms of the travel ban, member states are obliged to prevent entry into their territories of the listed individuals, and currently the EU has 166 individuals and 37 entities that are listed in relation to the Russia sanctions. Second area of concern, energy sector restrictions. There are restrictions on the direct or indirect export, supply, sale or transfer of listed equipment suited to the energy industry, that's known as Annex 2 equipment, to any person, entity or body in Russia or for use in Russia. Now, Annex 2 is very widely drawn and accordingly a good number of exports related to the energy industry are likely to be caught. 
In order for those exports to be lawful, a license is required, but it will be denied where the member state competent authority has grounds to determine that the export is for deep water oil, arctic oil or shale oil, unless it concerns the execution of obligation arising from a contract concluded before the 1st of August 2014, which is when the sanctions were brought in, or it's necessary for the urgent prevention or mitigation of an event likely to have serious and significant impact on human health and safety or the environment. Not just the goods themselves that are restricted, however. There are also restrictions on the direct or indirect provision of technical assistance, brokering services, financing, financial assistance that's related to equipment on Annex 2 being provided to any person or entity or body in Russia or for use in Russia. So accordingly, an Annex 2 item that is situated in Russia, there's a technical support obligation on the supplier, the supplier can no longer provide that technical support without applying for a license. And again, in respect of licenses, similar exemptions apply to in relation to the goods themselves. There are also restrictions on the provision of certain services for deep water oil, arctic oil and shale oil exploration and production, namely drilling, well testing, logging completion services and the supply of specialised floating vessels. And again, unless it's an obligation which arose from a contract concluded before the 12th of September 2014, which is when this particular restriction was brought in, or again, if there is a health and safety pressing need for the provision of those services. Lending restriction. There is a prohibition on the direct or indirect making of loans or credit with a maturity exceeding 30 days to a number of listed Russian entities, which include various Russian oil companies, Rosneft, Transneft, Gazpromneft, and also various Russian banks. The prohibition extends to their majority-owned subsidiaries outside of the EU. It also extends to any entities, including entities in the EU, that are acting on behalf of or at the direction of those listed Russian entities or their non-EU subsidiaries. Again, there are exemptions, in this case, where the loan has a specific and documented objective to provide financing for non-prohibited imports or exports of goods and non-financial services between the EU and any third country, or provide emergency funding to meet solvency and liquidity criteria for EU majority-owned subsidiaries of listed Russian entities, or if the loan was made under a contract concluded before the 12th of September 2014, when this restriction was brought in, provided that all terms and conditions have not since been modified. There are additional restrictions on the direct or indirect dealing with transferable securities and money market instruments with a maturity exceeding 30 days to 90 days, uh, depending on when the particular restriction was brought in, issued by listed Russian entities, so the same entities that we talked about earlier, and again, they're non-EU subsidiaries, and again, entities acting on behalf of or at the direction of those listed Russian entities or their non-EU subsidiaries. But it should be noted there's no restrictions against borrowing from listed Russian entities or their affiliates. It's only a restriction on extending credit to them or helping them to raise money on the capital markets. In terms of other restrictions, quite wide-ranging restrictions uh, on dealings with Crimea and Sevastopol, and also wide-ranging restrictions on the provision of military or dual-use goods. Dual-use goods are certain listed goods which can have either a military, uh, which can have a military or a civilian application. And again, restrictions around financing, financial assistance, technical assistance, in relation to the same. So looking at enforcement in the EU, well, enforcement is delegated to each individual member state. So each country within the EU lays down its, lays down its own rules on penalties for the infringement of sanctions. 
Penalties vary from member state to member state, from fines to custodial sentences typically. And one of the complexities is that member states may have differing interpretations of the EU legislation. There have been attempts to clarify the scope of the EU sanctions with Commission guidance in December 2014, uh, updated in September 2015, and the Council's EU best practices for effective implementation of sanctions, which is updated in March 2015. Much of the legislation, however, still has extremely broad wording and terminology, leading to considerable doubt as to the extent of some of that legislation. It is a defence for parties who can demonstrate that they did not know and had no reasonable cause to suspect that their actions would infringe sanctions. However, it is also an offence to participate in activities with the object or effect of circumventing sanctions. Those two provisions, catch-all provisions, uh, one, one in favour of innocent parties, one against parties who are trying to act in a way which seeks to get round the strict wording of the sanctions. So, the future. Well, at a summit in February 2015 in Minsk, the leaders of Ukraine, Russia, France and Germany agreed to a package of measures to alleviate the ongoing war in the Donbass region of Ukraine. The Minsk agreements called for a number of requirements to be implemented. The ceasefire was to begin at midnight local time on the 15th of February. Heavy weapons were withdrawn beginning on the 17th of February and completed within two weeks. There was to be an amnesty for prisoners involved in fighting, withdrawal of all foreign troops and weapons from Ukrainian territory and disarmament of all illegal groups, lifting of restrictions in rebel areas of Ukraine, constitutional reform to enable decentralization for rebel regions by the end of 2015, and Ukrainian control of the border with Russia to be restored by the end of 2015. So far, piecemeal and mixed success. Some of those requirements have been accomplished, some still, still a considerable way to go. The deadline for implementing the Minsk agreements was the 31st of December 2015, and the EU has effectively sought to synchronize its sanctions with that deadline. The position taken by the EU is that once Minsk is fully implemented and proven to be fully implemented, then the majority of the Russian sanctions will be lifted. Accordingly, the EU has extended the economic sanctions until the 31st of January 2016. It's extended the asset freezes and travel restrictions through to the 15th of March 2016 and has extended the Crimea sanctions until the 23rd of June 2016. In recent weeks, there's been very good progress in relation to the implementation of the Minsk agreements, and for the first time, probably since the signing of the Minsk agreements, there is genuine optimism on the ground that it may be possible for a settlement to be implemented in accordance with, with Minsk. The current thinking is that those are, the Minsk agreements are unlikely to be implemented by the end of this year, and accordingly an extension of a number of months for the implementation of the same is likely. But provided those agreements are implemented within that extension period, then there looks to be a good chance that EU sanctions would be lifted. Conversely, if the Minsk agreements are not met, and at the end of 2015 the position has deteriorated from where it is now, then sanctions may be ramped up depending on the reaching of a consensus within, within the EU in relation to the same. Speculations to different areas which might be restricted in those circumstances, including the gas sector. And with that, I'd like to hang over, hand over to Arma Adams to give an overview of the U.S. sanctions on Russia and Iran. Thank you very much, Chris. As uh, Chris just mentioned, I'm now going to turn to the U.S. programs on Russia and Iran, including a summary 
of the recent agreement by the U.S. government to suspend certain U.S. sanctions against Iran. This chart provides a brief overview of the U.S. sanctions programs in general. The programs have various levels of restrictions that I think are important to keep in mind as we go forward. Some of our sanctions programs in the United States are what we call comprehensive country-based programs, and those are the sanctions programs we have in place with respect to Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Sudan, Syria, and now the Crimea region of the Ukraine. Essentially, these sanctions programs prohibit U.S. person activities involving these countries with certain very limited exceptions. Some of our sanctions programs are also sector-based and restrict U.S. person activities in connection with various industries in countries' economies, and an example of that would be what we currently have in connection with Russia. The U.S. also has what we call blocking sanctions, which apply to persons and entities that are associated with certain countries and are identified persons and entities that are associated with certain countries and are identified on the specially designated nationals and block persons list, the SDN list. This, loo- this list includes persons and entities that can be involved in a variety of different sorts of transactions that are against U.S. foreign policy or national security, including narcotics trafficking, terrorism, or the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. There are also persons or entities on these, this list that are related to certain countries, including the Balkans, Iraq, Liberia, and Libya. Again, U.S. persons are generally prohibited from dealing with persons and entities on the SDN list. Now, who must comply with U.S. sanctions? In general, U.S. sanctions programs only apply to U.S. person. The definition of U.S. person, however, can vary depending on the sanctions programs. For most of our programs in the United States, U.S. persons are defined as an entity organized under the laws of the United States, including a foreign branch or office of a U.S. entity, any individual who is a U.S. citizen or permanent resident of the United States wherever they are located or employed, or any person or entity that is physically located or present in the United States. For the Cuba and Iran sanctions programs, the definition of U.S. persons is slightly expanded, and it has been expanded to include any entity that is owned or controlled directly or indirectly by a U.S. person. And as we'll discuss in a bit more detail later, the U.S. has also imposed secondary sanctions on foreign persons that engage in certain activities with Iran. It is these sanctions that are the focus of the suspension of certain sanctions under the JCPOA. Now we'll turn to Russia and the Ukraine-related sanctions. The Ukraine-related sanctions involve several features from that chart I first showed on slide one, including a comprehensive embargo against Crimea, sectoral sanctions against certain parts of the Russian economy, travel bans against individuals, and a listing of certain Russian, Ukrainian, and Crimean persons or entities on the SDN list. Now, the financial industry sectoral sanctions are captured under Directive 1, which prohibits U.S. persons from transacting in, providing financing for, or otherwise dealing in a new debt of more than 30 days maturity or new equity for the six financial and banking institutions listed below on this slide. Directive 2, which is what we, where we have encompassed the energy industry sectoral sanctions, prohibits U.S. persons from transacting in, providing financing for, or otherwise dealing in new debt of a maturity of greater than 90 days for the following four Russian energy companies and entities. Under Directive 4 of the Energy Industry Sectoral Sanctions, U.S. persons are prohibited from providing, exporting, or re-exporting any goods, services, or technology to any of the five energy companies listed below on this slide in support of exploration or production for deep water, Arctic offshore, or shale projects that have the potential to produce oil in Russia. Now, it's important to know that in addition to the OFAC energy industry sectoral sanctions, the U.S. government has also imposed export control restrictions on the Russian energy sector. Unlike the OFAC sanctions, these these energy export control restrictions apply to both U.S. and non-U.S. persons because the restrictions attached to the items 
based on their U.S. origin. Therefore, non-U.S. and U.S. persons are prohibited from exporting, re-exporting, or engaging in in-country transfers of items subject to the EAR to the following five energy companies and the Russian energy sector when that exporter or re-exporter knows or has reason to know or is unable to ascertain whether the item will be used in exploration or production of oil and gas projects in deep water, Arctic offshore, or shale formation projects in Russia. It's also important to note that U.S. and non-U.S. persons are also prohibited from exporting, re-exporting, or transferring in country certain spe specifically designated items which are also subject to the EAR when, again, the exporter, re-exporter, or transfer knows or knows, excuse me, knows, has reason to know, or again is unable to ascertain that the items will be used directly or indirectly in deep water, Arctic offshore, or shale formation projects in Russia. In terms of what we mean as subject to the EAR, the U.S. government has defined subject to the EAR to include all U.S. origin items and any foreign-made products that incorporate a de minimis level or threshold of U.S. origin components. And in the case of Russia and the Ukraine-related sanctions, that de minimis level is 25% or more, excuse me, more than 25% threshold. In addition to the sectoral-based sanctions, the U.S. government has also imposed a comprehensive country embargo of the Ukraine-related sanctions. The Crimea embargo generally prohibits all direct or indirect imports, exports of goods, technology, or services to or from Crimea by U.S. persons. The definition of U.S. persons for the purposes of this program includes any entity that is incorporated in the United States, any person or entity that is physically located in the United States, or any U.S. citizen or U.S. permanent resident wherever they're located. The definition does not include foreign entities that are owned or controlled by U.S. persons. Now, what is the future of the Russian sanctions? The Obama administration has very clearly stated that the Crimea sanctions will not be lifted even if the Minsk agreement is implemented because the U.S. government considers Crimea to be part of Ukraine. Similar to the EU position that Chris mentioned, the EU-related sanctions could be removed or eased if the Minsk agreement is fully implemented by all sides. In the event of what has been deemed significant violations of the Minsk agreement, the U.S. government has indicated that it is prepared to increase the sanctions that it has imposed against Russia. Some of those could include adding more companies to the various directives, shortening the maturity term dates for debt, expanding Directive 4 to include gas projects and not just projects that have the potential to produce oil, and removing some Russian financial or banking institutions from the SWIFT system. The U.S. government has been working over the last 18 months in conjunction with the EU and would like to continue to do so but the Obama administration has been clear that if it believes that it needs to act on its own in light of significant violations of the Minsk Agreement, it is prepared to do so. At this time, the U.S. government has developed contingency plans to implement in either scenario of escalation of the situation on the ground or the de-escalation of the situation through the Minsk Agreement. And now I'll turn to the Iran sanctions. First, to give a little bit of background about the Iran sanctions, it's important to keep in mind that Iran has the Iran sanctions program that is administered by the U.S. government has two levels of sanctions, primary and secondary sanctions. The primary sanctions apply to U.S. persons and foreign entities that are owned or controlled by U.S. persons. Under the current sanctions programs in place, such U.S. persons are generally prohibited from engaging in all transactions and dealings involving Iran or the government of Iran. The secondary sanctions allow the U.S. government to penalize non-U.S. persons and U.S. persons, but the primary effect is on non-U.S. persons that are involved in several sectors of the Iranian economy, including petroleum development, petroleum refinancing, shipping, shipbuilding, and refining. Penalties for foreign persons under the secondary sanctions have included bans on export assistance from the Export-Import Bank, 
bans on licenses for the export of U.S. military, dual-use, or nuclear-related goods or technology to Iran, uh, bans on private U.S. bank loans exceeding $10 million, and bans on procurement contracts with the U.S. government. Now, as Kieran mentioned, the U.S. government is one of the parties that is a party to the JCPOA. And the U.S. government has committed that if Iran implements and maintains its obligations under the JCPOA, the U.S. government will suspend its nuclear-related secondary sanctions against Iran. It's important to note that the U.S. sanctions that apply most directly to U.S. persons and U.S.-owned or controlled foreign entities will largely remain in place and intact with very limited exceptions. If Iran is able to maintain its obligations under the agreement, the Obama administration is forecasting that the suspension of U.S. sanctions could occur between early to mid-2016. Once those sanctions, or if those sanctions are suspended, it is also important to keep in mind that the U.S. sanctions that have been imposed for non-nuclear reasons will continue to remain in effect. And as Kieran mentioned in his presentation regarding the EU, um, the suspension of these U.S. sanctions can become permanent over the course of 10 years, again, if Iran is able to maintain its obligations under the agreement. Now, what does sanctions relief look like under the U.S. program or the U.S. commitments under the JCPOA? At this time, sanctions relief is very narrowly focused and quite limited. However, we expect that it can it will have some significant impact on the nuclear-related sanctions that are directed at non-U.S. persons, including an easing of sanctions restrictions against financial and banking transactions, insurance transactions, and engagement with certain sectors of the Iranian energy, petroleum, and petrochemical industries. In short, one of the immediate upsides that is being forecasted as an effect of the U.S. suspension of sanctions is that it will be permissible for non-U.S. persons to purchase, acquire, sell, or market petroleum, petroleum products, petrochemical products, and natural gas to and from Iran. It is also envisioned that non-U.S. persons will be able to provide Iran support and investment, goods, services, and technology that can also be used in connection with Iran's energy sector also including the development of its petroleum resources and the domestic production of refined petroleum products and petrochemical products. It is also expected that Iran would have access to about $120 billion in foreign and exchange assets currency that up until now have been up, Iran has been unable to repatriate to its central bank. In terms of what U.S. persons may be able to do if Iran is able to maintain its obligations, it is expected that the U.S. government will issue licenses to allow U.S. persons to engage in certain activities. Those activities would include the importation into the U.S. of Iranian origin rugs and foodstuffs, um, permitting U.S. persons to engage in the sale of commercial passenger aircraft and related parts and services to Iran, and allow non-U.S. entities that are owned or controlled by U.S. persons to engage in certain activities that are approved under the JCPOA framework. Now, there will be certain restrictions that are going to be important to keep in mind with respect to the U.S. suspension of sanctions under the JCPOA. As I've already mentioned, the primary U.S. sanctions for U.S. persons and foreign entities that are owned or controlled by U.S. persons will remain intact. As such, U.S. persons will be banned from virtually engaging in all dealings with Iran and the government of Iran. So not very much is going to change. OFAC has stated that a general license will be issued for non-U.S. affiliates of U.S. companies to conduct or engage in certain business activities with Iran. General licenses generally authorize the performance of certain categories of transactions. However, it's going to be very important and critical that parties seeking to use any such general license understand and read the terms and conditions very closely to confirm that they and their transactions fit within the parameters of the general license. It is expected that OFAC will be publishing the terms of this general license in the coming weeks.
in terms of continuing limitations of the U.S. suspension of sanctions against Iran, it's anticipated that U.S. dollar-denominated transactions involving Iranian interest will continue to remain prohibited as those transactions will involve U.S. persons, banks that are involved in clearing and processing transactions, and will therefore have a nexus with the U.S. jurisdiction. Iran will also remain um, a, on the terrorism list, or as the United States government says, a state sponsor of terrorism. And therefore, any sanctions programs that are associated with that designation will remain in place, as will any sanctions related to Iran's human rights and weapons of mass destruction proliferation issues. Most importantly, this will include a continued maintenance of the U.S. export control restrictions on Iran for items that are subject to the EAR. Because the export control restrictions were largely imposed against Iran for terrorism activities and reasons, we expect that these restrictions will remain very firmly in place. Further, non-U.S. companies that are owned or controlled by U.S. persons will still be prohibited from dealing with parties in Iran that are owned or controlled by the government of Iran, even if they are formally delisted from the SDN list. In terms of non-U.S. persons, certain secondary sanctions against non-U.S. persons with respect to significant transactions with persons or entities that remain on the SDN list will still apply. It is expected that up to 200 Iranian persons or entities will remain on the SDN list, so it will be important for non-U.S. persons that may be considering engaging in transactions with any persons or entities on those lists really review and monitor the potential risks of engaging in significant transactions with those individuals or entities. In terms of what the future looks like for the U.S. sanctions program with respect to Iran under the auspices of the JCPOA, U.S. government officials continue to urge compliance caution. There will continue to be a complicated or complex mix of interlocking controls and sanctions programs that will remain in place, including differences that may continue to exist between EU and U.S. sanctions programs that U.S. and non-U.S. persons will need to continue to review and monitor over the course of the next few months. As I've noted earlier, there will not be a full removal of all U.S. sanctions programs against Iran, so it's going to be critical that U.S. and non-U.S. persons continue to monitor developments to see what sanctions programs will continue to be in place with respect to Iran under both the primary and secondary sanctions and it is expected that OFAC will be publishing in the coming weeks additional information about what sanctions programs will not be suspended under the auspices of the JCPOA. Therefore, especially for non-U.S. companies where there may be some leeway under suspen sus the suspension of sanctions, it will be very important to take continued precautions to make sure they stay in compliance with the scope of relief that is being provided by all the JCPOA participants but also keep in mind that there will be other sanctions that will continue to remain in place and in force. We expect that financial institutions, both U.S. and non-U.S. financial institutions, will continue to be conservative with respect to Iran due to the complex nature of correspondent relationships and the predominant use of U.S. dollar-denominated transactions in international transactions and agreements. Again, the timeline for the JCPOA implementation is not fluid and continues, excuse me, is fluid and continues to remain subject to performance obligations by all the participants, including Iran, most notably at this point. At the beginning of the JCPOA agreement, it was stated that perhaps some sanctions relief might come into effect at the end of 2015, but that date continues to be pushed out, and now the Obama administration is not expecting any sanctions relief most likely to mid-2016. And as Kieran mentioned in his discussion of the EU-Iranian sanctions, there is still a snapback provision in the JCPOA, which continues to suggest that all parties take a cautious and measured approach. Because there is not a savings clause for any contracts entered into under the suspension period of the JCPOA, it is possible that if a Security Council member take steps to have 
the Iranian sanctions, suspension relief, terminated or suspended, that any contracts entered into during the suspension period will need to be terminated and ceased immediately. Iran certainly will continue to present significant challenges, even with the suspension of sanctions, especially with respect to U.S. persons and U.S. person employees that may be working for foreign companies who will want to make sure that they do not find themselves in a situation of facilitating or appro approving transactions that they as U.S. persons cannot be engaged with under the primary sanctions. We expect that the U.S. authorities will continue to monitor activities before and following the implementation of the JCPOA and that enforcement of the remaining Iranian sanctions programs, both primary and secondary, will continue to be, remain, will continue to be a top enforcement priority for the U.S. government.